If you've been listening to the pod, you know I'm marking my calendar for the big sale from Last Bottle Wines, one of our wonderful sponsors. If you don't already know, they're a Napa-based online wine shop that offers 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part, there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase, just a daily email with really great wine. And as I mentioned, they're having a massive sale. Their marathon sale is coming up on March 28th and 29th. They flip that one wine per day rule on its head and instead offer back-to-back, two-back deals. That means wines are only up on the site for a couple minutes at a time. We got a preview order with the mini marathon package of some of their favorites, and I'm telling you, it's a sale you want to get in on. And the best part is we're offering Datable listeners 10% off your first order with code Datable. Sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use the code Datable and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find someone worth deleting the app for. Hi, I'm Yui Xu. And I'm Julie Kraftchik. We're active daters turned dating sociologists. Here to dive into everything modern dating and relationships. Welcome to the Dateable Podcast. Friends, welcome to a brand new episode of Dateable in our off on season (laughs) where you get just us, but we also air some previous podcasts we've been on where we've been the guests. So you probably haven't heard these episodes for many of you. So we keep the content going until we launch season 18 very soon. I cannot believe it. I always say that, but another year. (laughs) But yeah, I'm really glad that we're able to relaunch some of these episodes, though, because when listening back, they were really freaking good. And it's like a little bit of a shift, you know, having us as the guests versus the hosts. It's really fun being a guest on other people's podcasts because we don't have to do any (laughs) pre-planning. Yeah, we just We just answer questions. And we just shoot shoot the shit. We don't have to worry about mics not working or tech not working because that's, that's on their end. <laughs> yes. And the episode we have today is with a crowd favorite, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. We've had her on our podcast the most of any guest. Does this technically make her a four-timer? We said it was a three-timer before. Oh, you're I right. Think so. She is a champ. She is. We crowned her most dateable guest. <laughs> <laughs> she certainly is. If she were single, I I would say. <laughs> I have a girl say. crush she's, on her, that's for sure. <laughs> she's just so articulate and full of wisdom. We originally found her because she teaches this course at Northwestern about marriage, mm-hmm. Marriage 101. And first of all, she, why is this not taught at every university yeah. or high school? Okay. But also, she's just such an engaging lecturer mm-hmm. that these classes are often weightless. Mm -hmm. And people from all different disciplines come and take this class, you know, regardless of their major. But she also has her own podcast where she doles out this wisdom. It's a fantastic podcast. And I know, Julie, you've used a lot of her techniques. I have. But also, which is funny. So my cousin went to Northwestern. And when Mm. I told her about having Dr. Alexandra Solomon on the podcast, she was in awe because she had tried to get into the class and got waitlisted. Right. 
So right? side note there. But yeah, she was very popular. But yeah, her podcast, I will like give her credit to this day that she really helped me in my relationship. Mm-hmm. We've had her on, you know, the first time we had her was about marriage 101, her course mm-hmm. and like how it extends beyond marriage. The second time was about her book, Taking Sexy Back. And the third time was about pace discrepancy. So you can see she runs the spectrum of types of topics as well. And with pace discrepancy, I was experiencing this with my partner I shared this but like I was ready to move forward a little faster than him like we had our same you Mm -hmm. know goals but just our personalities I was the one that was ready to go so with her podcast I was able to find that I remember I just like forget what I searched for and then her podcast came up Mm. and it was so helpful because it first of all gave the language of a pace discrepancy and when you don't have the language around what's actually happening she completely normalized normalized it and she gave a check-in to do and we did that check-in i had my partner listen to the episode he listened it was so helpful to us so i'm like forever grateful for dr alexandra solomon more than she might even realize i think you and probably millions of other people (laughs) owe it to her for just the way she views relationships is so such a fresh perspective Mm -hmm. she is in academia but she doesn't come at it from this sterile clinical way She's very much about speaking from the heart. And what I've appreciated about her, even being on her podcast, is that, you know, sometimes like when you do podcasts and, you know, when we do our podcast, too, you feel like you have to fill the silence. Mm, mm-hmm. like you have to always answer the question right away or think about the next thought. Listen to her and observe her in her podcast. She takes a beat yeah. before she says anything because she's so intentional with her words. And also she's not reactive. She's really thinking about how do I best to answer this question. And I've learned that from her in my relationships Mm. is take that beat before you say something to your partner. You don't need to fill silence in a relationship. Yeah, I think the taking a beat is so, so important. She also said something, something on the very first episode that has stuck with me through all my relationships is conflict is inevitable. And Mm. if you think that like you just won't have conflict with someone else, you're fooling yourself. So what she sees people do is they leave at any sign of conflict and then bounce to the next person. But mm-hmm. it will manifest with the next person in a different way. Like anytime your relationship gets to a certain level, something is going to come up. It doesn't mean that it's like fighting conflict, but something that you don't see 100% eye to eye is going to happen. Like that is because we are two human beings coming together with different thought patterns. So I just love how she normalizes this stuff. So then when it's happening, you're not like, oh my God, this relationship is doomed or whatever. She actually normalizes a lot of things that you may be ashamed of in a relationship. She really peels back the layers and is like, everybody is experiencing this and should be experiencing this is totally normal. Yeah, she's just so wonderful. I know we could go on all day (laughs) praising her. I do love though how she called our episode the highs and lows of finding your person with a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I like that she appreciated that we do bring a sense of humor to dating. And I think it is really important because I'm just like rethinking about my highs and lows of finding my person or just the journey in general. And having that sense of humor was so pivotal because there were some like crazy times and like if you can't have a sense of humor about it like it's gonna be a hard road yeah it'd be really miserable we see life through so many different filters and if your filter is like looking for the negative looking for where things go wrong looking for why me why is this happening to me then you're not going to be very happy (laughs) going through this journey I just was thinking back earlier of like dating in general. And I just remember I had this like one week. It was just so terrible. Like I had this one guy that literally the entire date, he told me how terrible women were. And then at the end of the date, he asked to split the bill like down to the penny and (laughs) at the end like he was telling me something about like he was like talking about his ex and like how their sex life and like things that I just like didn't need to know it was just Mm. a terrible date and I was literally there for one glass of wine that I had to split down to the penny (laughs) and that day it happened and then like I remember like a day later I went on another date and the guy was so wasted when he showed up that he just stared at my boobs the whole time like his like head was like in 
between my boobs and I was just like this is so uncomfortable and I just remember like leaving and like both of them following up with me and I'm just like I can't with either of you two like this was so bad but I think having the sense of humor that you're just like how ridiculous is this like (laughs) what is happening like I had to have a sense of humor with that but in their mind it was like the best date (laughs) it was that well the drunk guy I don't think he knew what world he was in but yeah he like hit me up the next day he's like I had a great time last night I'm like really couldn't stand still how weird (laughs) how weird that two people can be on the same date and walk away with such different experiences (laughs) every time every time another vote for sober dating by the way. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I do like this thought of like highs and lows of finding your person though. We didn't really talk about on this episode, like our own individual journeys Mm. and like, what are those highs and lows? Like I definitely have a few moments that come to mind in both. I mean, one low maybe you could say with those dates, but I think the biggest low I had, there were two that come to mind. One was, you know, just not being able to get out of bed after my ex like abruptly broke up with me the first Mm. time like my most serious ex I just remember that feeling of just being like I finally found this person that I thought was so great and we were on the same page and then all of a sudden like he couldn't be in a serious relationship Mm. like after saying that he wanted to be in one and I just remember feeling gutted like not being able to get out of bed but at the end of the day that's actually what got me to go to therapy and I think it changed me completely so I'm glad it happened but in the moment that was definitely a gutted low (sighs) yep that feeling (laughs) of not wanting to do life is uh, definitely a low. Thank you for reminding me, Julie, before we start recording. She's like, I remember your low. I'm like, yeah, definitely. That (laughs) finding those text messages between my ex and the girl he was cheating on me with, definitely ultimate low. And what is good is that in that moment, I did think like, what the fuck? This is how my story goes. And then my next thought was, what's next? What's on the next page? And I I really appreciate having that, that kind of mindset because I had been through a heartbreak and I always knew that on the next page, something better was coming along. But in that moment, hell yeah, I was pissed and (laughs) crying, but also angry. I was feeling a little violent and also just all the all the different emotions. It was such a roller coaster. And I never want to feel that again or have anybody feel that. That's just, ugh, it's just soul crushing. I know. It's hard to say like that wasn't a low. Like clearly it was, but it it's easier now in retrospect to see like the positives that even the lows bring. Yeah. But in the moment, they feel so, so gutted. I think this is another one that comes to mind for me. And it's more about just like maybe a personal low. But it's the fact that I had a two-year friends with benefits situationship. Mm -hmm. And he like legit made out with another girl. Oh my gosh. And I still stuck around for it. (sighs) Like that was a low. Just the whole thing was a low. Someone telling me I do not want to be in a relationship. And I still stayed in it and like hoping to change their mind. That was a low. And also like looking back, like I was not, this person's like not even attractive attractive to me in the slightest. Like my friends made fun of the fact that I was like with this person. Yet I built this person up Mm -hmm. to be like the love of my life, even though there were no signs of him also feeling the same way. I was in a total fantasy for that one. It's sad the kind of behavior we tolerate in people when we like them so much. It's embarrassing. It's things we wouldn't even share with our friends till years later. And to, to even have those words come out of your mouth, like I saw him make out with another girl in front of me. I'm sure you look back and think, what the fuck were you doing yeah Julie? yeah and you could justify it right mm-hmm. i was like oh we're not actually together but it's like we're still in the same room and there is a common decency that the person you're sleeping with is watching you right yes this minute, you know and you're supposed to be friends we were friends like that's why it also stayed in <sighs> a bad state is i could not escape him because we're in the same friend group so like even if you're not like in a committed relationship as a friend mm-hmm. that's fucked up it's really fucked up <laughs> that's definitely a low yeah it was a low (laughs) 
<laughs> a lot of that was low. But the positive of it is after that, I was like, I'm never doing that again. Like if someone tells me they don't want to be in a relationship, I'm done. Like, I'm not going to stand for like a friends with benefits thing. Like I'll hear someone at face value from now on. Maybe those of you who are listening will find this relatable. Do you feel like sometimes you have to go through a low in order to learn yes. that lesson? So you Absolutely. have to be very grateful for that moment. You know, for me, finding out my ex was cheating was probably the best thing to happen to me in that relationship for me to realize he was not the right person. If I never found yeah. out he was cheating and we just had an amicable breakup, I wouldn't have had the answers or the closure that I needed to yeah. move on from that relationship. And for you to, to see him make out with someone else in front of you <laughs> to say, I will not tolerate this fucking behavior moving forward. If, if he just said, Julie, I think it's time we actually see other people and like not engage in this yeah. friends with benefit relationship, you probably would have been brushed thinking you had to convince him to think otherwise. So yeah, sometimes we need to go through the lows to learn that lesson. I don't know. I had a bunch of like amicable breakups, Mm -hmm. like my ex of the longest relationship that was on again, off again. That one was on again, off again, because it like never was like a bad breakup and it was always like a, uh-huh. this is where I am right this yep. moment and I still want to be with you. It's like he kept me on the hook yep. for so long but it never was like, oh, he did something terrible or right. he was a bad person and it was almost worse because I couldn't move yes. on, right? When they just really fuck up or do something terrible you're like, nope, I'm good. I don't want to be with this person, you know? Yeah, it's very black and white a lot of times. It's like more of an ego hit yeah. initially but I think long term it could be better. Yes. Not to say that you have to go through all the lows to no. to learn your lessons. I think you go through one and then you learn to never allow that to happen again, yes. right? So your next breakup can be amicable, but sometimes we do go through that just to have a more amicable relationship later. I mean, I think the lows I shared actually contributed to my growth of relationships because mm-hmm. like I mentioned, after that situation ship, I was like, I'm never going to be with someone that won't commit to being in a relationship or says they don't want to be in a relationship. And then I met my other other acts, like the most, you know, significant acts, and he did want to be in a relationship, but it was this on again, off again, highs and lows. And then after him, I was like, I don't want that highs and lows. Like I want someone who's in it with me, like doing life with me, consistently showing up. And that brought me to my current partner. So I do think it is important to recognize like the stages of these lows and they how they go to highs. Mm. Okay, so the highs. Let's get high. What are your highs? What are your highs? <laughs> I just talked for a while. (laughs) The highs. I think the highs across the board has always been the moment when you realize the two of you are on the same frequency. Yeah. That is such a good feeling when you really like someone and then they really like you back. Mm -hmm. God, there's no better feeling in the world. And to be able to verbalize (laughs) that and to be able to lean into that because so much of dating is trying to pull away from it, not just showing too much Mm -hmm. of your feelings. But when you when someone almost gives you permission to like them more, you lean into that. That's just such a great feeling. And I know those that feeling doesn't last forever. And yes, it's always (laughs) like in the beginning of a relationship and it comes and goes. But to savor that moment when you both have this click, a click in, like, Mm -hmm. ooh, yeah, we're meant to be with each other in this moment. I was thinking of highs and that definitely came to mind. I had a date with my one past boyfriend, the one that got had to leave and move to the UK. Mm-hmm. We just had that. It was just like that date that you just, it was just like electricity from like the beginning, yeah. you know, and we were the last people in this bar, like closed the whole yeah. thing down. And then as soon as we left the bar, it was like a makeout sesh. It was just like that magic. And I'm yes. just like that night, I will always remember as just that perfect first date like the epitome of a first date yes and yeah it's what you said it's like that like clicking feeling yeah when it's just the two of you in the world and there's no care just just you two Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah I think another high for me I mean even though I said that there was clearly a low because I was just devastated couldn't get out of bed and the relationship did go on for a long time on again off again but that ex of mine like it was the first time I fell in love and that like was a high overall. Mm-hmm. Like, I think even though it was not a forever relationship, it still had like a lot of love and meaning. And I think like we did have like a soulmate type connection. Like I think we were meant to come into each other's 
characters' lives. And I know that sounds corny, but I do believe that. And I felt so much in that relationship, more than I'd ever felt before up until that point. So for me, that was a high overall, even though it came with some lows. It kind of shows that I'm kind of under under this belief that if a relationship has highest of highs, it'll probably have the lowest of lows. And a sustainable relationship may not have the highest of highs, but they certainly mm-hmm. won't drop to the lows. Like those magical moments of just being in love and not having a care in the world, there is a little <laughs> bit of like abandoning responsibility in that moment. Yeah. You just feel like, ah, who cares? Fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to be in this moment. And they're great. But also for a sustainable relationship, you can't be feeling that way. No. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, the highest of all my highs is my current partner and meeting him and just like the day to day life that we live. And yeah, it's like what you said. It's like they're maybe not as extreme highs, but just the fact that it's been just unlike any relationship. Yeah. Across the board exceeded my expectations of what a relationship could be because I've never felt like so, you know, seen and heard by someone. And just I was thinking about it, too. It's like, I didn't need someone to save me. I needed someone to just be there with me. And I think that's what I've gotten from that relationship. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And maybe when you're listening to this, our listeners, think about your highs and lows. <laughs> kind of take inventory. What did the highs teach you? And what did the lows lead you to? That's always yeah. such a great exercise to do. Highs and lows. I think that that sums up dating. That's for sure. <laughs> so well, we have a whole episode filled with humor and advice and all the feels with Dr. Alexandra Solomon. We even answer some questions at the end from her listeners who we guarantee have the same types of questions as you all. So stay tuned and continue on with this episode. But before we get into it, at Dateable Podcast, that's our handle. Find us on Instagram at nonplatonic at Julie Kraftchik. Those are our individual IGs and TikTok. Find us there. We are there as well. And of course, in the new Facebook group, yes, the old Facebook group rebranded Big Dateable Energy, BDE. And we had a really fun happy hour the other night that people could come to virtually and meet other members. So make sure to join if you're not already there. Okay, before we get into it with Dr. Alexandra Solomon, let's take a minute to hear from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to viahemp.com and use the code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's viahemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Out. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATEABLE at OseaMalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over for $60. So head to OSEA Malibu.com and use the code 
Relatable for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. This episode is made possible by Armoire. Armoire makes getting dressed easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, build the perfect wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. All you have to do is take a five-minute style quiz and select items from your dynamic, personalized closet. The styles show up at your door in as little as two days. Then when you're ready for new clothes, just swap them out. Listen, I live in Southern California. There is absolutely no need for puffer coats or any sort of those winter jackets. But when I travel anywhere else in the world in these cold months, I'm often burdened with the task of getting winter clothes. And now with Armoire, I can just rent my winter wardrobe. It's brilliant. Right now, our listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash datable. That is armoire.style spelled A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try Armoire today. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. In the new year, what are some things you want to keep the same about yourself or your life? Where are you already crushing it? Around New Year's, we get so obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. And therapy can do just that. Help you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. My therapist really helped me discover my resilience. After my terrible breakup last year, it has been really nice to rediscover what I do best, bouncing back. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash datable today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. Okay, let's hear the episode from Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Hi, UA and Julie. Thank you for being here with me today. Oh, thanks so much for having us, Alexandra. It's so nice to be here with you, but also we've had you on our show three times. So we like to brag about that. <laughs> We're so excited to be here. I'm in the Three Timers Club for the Dateable Podcast, a proud card carrying member of the Three Timers Club. <laughs> <laughs> the number one guest we've had, yes. <laughs> Am I the only three timer? You are the only three timer, we realized. There's a few two timers, but only you as a three timer. Wow. I'm going to get myself a tiara. Uh, no, we'll get you one. Don't get yourself one. You'll get me a tiara. The dateable. I mean, there probably should be a dateable tiara. There should be. <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> Add it to your list. So obviously, this is an episode all about the daters. We are supporting all of the listeners of Reimagining Love who are in the dating world. And frankly, all the people who love people in the dating world, because it's a lot about... Those of us who love daters, you know, how we show up for them, how we support them, what we say and don't say. So this is an episode for everybody, but really we're talking about kind of common issues and challenges in the world of dating with, with the two of you, because that's obviously you are the ones to talk to about this. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, I want to ask you the question that I ask all of the guests of Reimagining Love, which is the relational self-awareness question. Are you ready for it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, for each of you, what is a growing edge that you are working on in one of your important relationships, and what has it been teaching you these days? Yeah, I mean, I could go first. I feel like I shared this on our podcast, but you have helped me so much with this. Like, my partner and I do your check-in every week, and we talk about relational growing edge. And I think for us, we really resonated with the faster pace, slower pace, pace discrepancy, which we talked at at length on our podcast. And, mm -hmm. you know, we've gotten over a lot of the hurdles with that. We're now living together. But I think it's something that 
will always persist in some way just because of our natures. Like I'm more of a go, 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 where my partner's more of like, let's take it all in and, you know, really think through everything. And I think what I've learned is that's actually a really good, important balance to have because we complement each other really well. Like we move things forward, but we're also, you know, doing it in a way that's comfortable and we're both at a place that we're ready for whatever next step. So I've really like struggled with this because like I think it by nature is, you know, someone that just wants to get things done and move <laughs> things forward. And I'm very, you know, achievement oriented in work and all of that. But I've realized that it doesn't need to be such a rush in love all the time. Of course, like your needs need to be met and you need to be moving forward, but it doesn't need to be like on a set timeline as much as I think I thought it had to be. Hmm. That's great. So your growing edge really is savoring and celebrating the work yeah. that the two of you have done to transform yeah. what had felt like a frightening and worrisome difference between the two of you. And you're really like your growing edge is to kind of hold and savor. This is a yeah. difference. It's going to keep popping up in all different moments in our relationships and chapters of our commitment story. And it's not a it's not a deal breaker. It's just something that we we work with and there are mm -hmm. benefits to both of our ways of being. Yeah, that's the shift for sure. That's the shift. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, and we'll put a link in the show notes of the episode that the mm -hmm. three of us did together on your show because yes. we really did dive into that pace discrepancy, um, which is such a, it's just so prevalent and so freaking tender. So yes. Good. Well, thank you, Julie, for sharing that. Well, thank you for helping me. <laughs> <laughs> you, I have up for you. I uh, recently got out of a five-year relationship, and before that, I was in a two-year relationship. So I think this is a moment for myself to really develop that self-love. And after this recent breakup, I realized Growing up in an Asian household and being very much entrenched in Asian culture, there is no such thing as self-love. Everything we do is for uh. other people. Everything we do is in relation to other people. Even when we work on personal development and bettering ourselves, it's for the betterment of other people around us. It's for our parents, it's for our uh, relatives. So this is my moment. I feel like I'm doing everything for myself and myself only, um, finding out what self-love truly means and doing all the things that I love, um, like tennis right now is my new obsession. And every time I play tennis, I almost want to cry because I'm like, I'm only doing this for myself. Nobody else is benefiting from this except for me. And I'm just so proud of myself for taking this moment and not calling it selfish, calling it self-love. That was exactly the question I was going to ask is, are you, is your growing edge around, like, to what degree do you find yourself having to manage a little voice in your head that says self-love is selfish or this is selfish? How has that been for you? Is it easier now to manage that or to resist the urge to call it selfish than it was in the beginning? What's that process been like? There's this voice inside my head that always says, if your cup is not full, you can't give to other people. You can't be there for other people. So whenever I feel that that guilt of, am I being selfish? I just tell myself, no, I'm just filling my cup right now so that I have more to give to other people. Beautiful. That's so beautiful, Yue. And I, I hear that there's a couple of things that are coming together. Like as you come out of a long-term relationship and sort of settle into this moment in your life. This is your work is around self-love and that there's parts of it that have to do with your cultural background and having grown up in a mm -hmm. deeply collectivistic culture, a deeply yes. we culture, a deeply family culture for all that is really beautiful about that, what you're aware of, because every, every cultural characteristic has elements to it for as beautiful as that is in your life, I'm sure in many ways, what it what it means is that you really have to be pretty actively working on letting things be just purely a means unto itself or an end unto itself. I get to play tennis just for me, not right. for somebody else, not to get to this next thing. It's just sort of the end unto itself. Right. Yeah. It's a hard shift, mm. but I'm getting there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 
That's good. And it's not selfishness. It's not selfishness. No, I love no. that you, I love that you've got that really solid counter, you know, which is my cup needs to be full if I'm going to give anything to anybody else. Exactly. Okay. So the two of you have been the co-hosts of the Dateable podcast for how long? How many episodes in are you? <laughs> We're a lot. A million. Over 300. And <laughs> over a million. Now, we've been doing this for over seven years at this point. So it's been a while. We're, you know, approaching that decade. And, you know, we both had experience even prior to the podcast, too. So we've been studying modern dating for quite some time. Tell me, tell us a little bit of the background of your relationship with each other and what inspired you to launch this show in the first place seven years ago. <laughs> I had just moved to San Francisco from two years in Beijing, and I was a dating coach in New York. I had dated in New York. I dated in Beijing, was a dating coach there. And when I moved to San Francisco, I was like, what the heck is this place? How are people dating this way? I've never <laughs> seen anything like it. It was just so, I felt like such a fish out of water. And I met Julie, who had only dated in San Francisco during her 20s at the time. So she was like, this is the norm. This is how people date, at least from my experience. So we were comparing notes and stories, and we thought, oh, we just got to share these stories. And our friends had really funny dating stories as all of our friends do. So we said, let's create a show. We didn't even call it a podcast. We're like, let's just record people telling their funny dating stories. And same with us. And we can share our experiences. And it grew out of that. And you know, our first couple seasons, we did it out of my studio apartment in San Francisco. <laughs> All of our guests were in real life and we had wine <laughs> and cheese. It was just like a big party because we just want to capture stories. <laughs> Which was mixed, obviously. It was fun to have wine and cheese, but you could see quickly how that could go off the rails also. <laughs> Very quickly. What's interesting, too, about like dating in San Francisco, I mean, I think now a lot of the stuff that UA was seeing back then is just the norm of digital dating. But yeah. San Francisco has always been like a tech hub, so it's like dating apps were always very prominent here. So I feel like what I experienced like a decade ago, like, you know, in 2017 is really when Tinder just started to explode. Like that was the start of everything. Because mm -hmm, Tinder just had its 10 year anniversary. So it was still pretty new. Then. Mm -hmm. So it was so new at that point, like all the dating apps, and we were just like at the cusp of it all. And it felt so normalized, yet I could see like coming from a different environment why that felt so odd. Is that what it was, UA? That was what I was going to ask you is what, so you were having this like cross-cultural experience, like <laughs> literally Beijing to um, San Francisco, but also New York to San Francisco. So you really were kind of like a stranger in a strange land trying to make sense of it. Like what was it that struck you and felt so confusing at that time? I think that's exactly it. It's that people, daters in San Francisco lead with tech. And I had come from an environment where tech was a supplement to how people meet people. One very unique experience I had in San Francisco was I was with someone who saw someone across the room and thought she was cute. And instead of approaching her, <laughs> he went on the apps to try to swipe for her, hoping they could match. That was just such a San Francisco experience because you're leading with the tech <laughs> and really relying on the data dating apps to make the match or introduction for you. And also, I think what was going on at the time was a lot of this discussion around gender equality uh, when it comes to um, salaries, when it comes to compensation and negotiations. So the whole lean in, Sheryl Sandberg, all of that was very prevalent. And so I had experienced a lot of men who would say things like, this is in San Francisco, uh, who would not open the door for me and tell me it's okay because we're equal now. You can open your own door. Or uh, I'd be saving a chair for a friend at a restaurant and some guy would take the chair and be like, your friend can't stand. It's fine. She's going to be fine by standing. <sighs> or uh, my first experience meeting someone in real life in San Francisco, he got my number and asked me out. And in the text, he said, do you want this to be a networking date or do you want this to be a romantic date? And I was I was like, oh. oh, I didn't know there was an option. So just very nuanced ways of looking at dating, which, like Julie said, it's not so 
unique anymore. But back then, I was just like so taken aback by it. I think another piece of like what happened in San Francisco that was before other areas too was just this explosion of polyamory and Mm non-monogamy and basically mm -hmm. questioning like how relationships need to work. And UA and I, while we're not non-monogamous right now, at least, we um, have this way of thinking, I think, really changed the way we both approach relationships. So it might not be like, oh, we're going to have tons of partners, but it did tell us, oh, we can actually make the rules. We can have relationships the way we want to do it. We call it like DIY your relationship, like you find the path. So I think a lot of this was just at the cusp of a lot of social change and then also technology at the same time. Yep, I hear that. So, I mean, you already are, are both touching on some of these themes, but how would you describe what you have seen that has shifted from, you know, how the two of you started the show seven years ago to now? Like, what are sort of the big big themes or the way that you think the dating world has changed over these seven years? I think a major shift has just been gender roles in general. I mean, if you listen to some of our earlier seasons, I had very strict gender (laughs) roles. It was the man's roles, this, the woman's roles, this, and these are the expectations. And that's what really screwed me in dating is because I wouldn't voice my needs. I would just expect the man to know what to do based on my expectations that society has told me all these years. Yeah, of the script. Yes. And the rules and the game, all of those terrible yeah. dating advice books and shows and <laughs> rom-coms that have just been ingrained in us where it wasn't it was never about communication, it was just about expectations. Uh, you know, nonverbal expectations. So the shift right now is people are understanding what communication means, communicating their needs, but also the gender roles are very much blurred now uh, to the point where it may be a little confusing for some, especially for this generation where we're just straddling the old and the new. We still have the, those expectations, but we also know we need to be more woke about it. Um, so I think there's just a lot of redesigning of the dating culture, uh, especially when it comes to gender roles, and everyone's trying to find their own path. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if I've talked with you guys about my idea that I ought to just sell to Match.com, which is, I think, especially for straight couples, but maybe also for queer couples where there's an array of sort of masculine to feminine presentation, because I do think this gets, I do think this trips up queer couples as well. I think on the dating apps on your profile, there ought to be a little slider bar that goes from how much do you love yeah differentiated gender roles and you want that door open, you want it to be super clear who's paying, or you slide it all the way over (sighs) to like free for all, we're going to work this all out, you know, don't open my door, whatever. But just like some, because I think you're right, UA, I mean, you both are speaking to this, that there's, as we transform, as we step outside of what was so obvious and so rule-based and so role-based, a free for all or an open playing field can be confusing. Mm. And then there are, I think there are times when people don't meet each other's expectations or disappoint each other, not because they want to, but because they're just afraid of doing something, quote unquote, the wrong way or the offensive way. And so I think a little slider bar would just go a long way. But what do you think? Should we market it? Absolutely. I think that (laughs) honestly is like the root of so many issues. Like we have this term that we call relationship chicken. Basically, where both parties aren't making any moves, you're afraid to show your cards, you're afraid to do anything. Like you said, you don't know what to do. You don't know what's right in today's world. And what it results in is a standstill where people are doing nothing. Relationships aren't moving forward. Both parties are complaining and nothing's happening. And that is not what either anyone wants, right? And that's actually one of the downfalls of modern dating today is it's ironic that you feel like there's so many options, so many people out there, yet we hear daters all the time saying it's so hard to actually like move a date in person off the apps. It's so hard to find someone to talk to. And none of it makes sense, but we really believe like this relationship chicken because no one knows how to operate is a lot of the problem. It's a perfect storm of shifting gender roles, 
plus vulnerability because to, because the only way mm. out of chicken is to tolerate the vulnerability of asking for clarity or becoming the relational leader, right? Leadership is the way you get out of chicken, but leadership is vulnerable as hell. And and it can confront whatever fears or or norms you have in your head around which of us ought to be ending this game of chicken. And what does it mean if I end it? And what does it mean if you end it? And none of us were taught about relationships in school. Like, that's why we love, like, what you talk about with relational self-awareness so much. And we actually really talk about this on the podcast of just building the relational skills because a lot of us don't have them. And that's why people ghost. It's not because they're, like, a terrible person. Ugh. A lot of times they just don't have any relational skills. And we've been taught to play games, to listen to rules and these hacks and quick fixes. And what we're really learning is that that is not what actually gets you into healthy, happy relationships at all. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So my wonderful producer, Elizabeth, has um, prepped <laughs> some little like little thumbnail scenarios that kind of bring together <laughs> themes that I know you both have approached on your show, themes that come up all the time in our listener questions and, you know, emails and all of that. So you ready? Should, should I throw one out there for us to work on? Please do. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm ready. I, I like this one a lot. Okay, so this is about introducing your new person to your friends. Mm. So Jen has a lot of friends, and they mean the world to her. Ever since she started dating Alexa, she knew there was the potential for something serious between them. And now that it's been a couple of months, her friends are dying to meet the person they've heard so much about. However, Jen is nervous because she knows she's going to put a lot of meaning into her friends' impressions and reactions towards Alexa. What if they don't like her? Because of this, she keeps putting off introducing them and Alexa's starting to feel hurt. What recommendations do we have for Jen? Mm, I like this question a lot. This is a, a situation that my friend Curly is going through as well. I love that Jen has the self-awareness to know that introducing Alexa to her friends means a lot to her. To some people, meeting the friends, meeting family doesn't have as much weight, but to her, it has a lot of weight. So that's kudos to her for knowing that. And I think what's important when you're introducing a partner to friends is to prep the friends as well. You know, sometimes we think, oh, I have to tell the partner and then tell them that this means a lot to me. But you also <laughs> need to tell the friends, listen, I'm about to introduce you to my partner. She means a lot to me. And this is a big gesture and I would really appreciate the respect, the warmth, the hospitality that you would normally give to anybody who's in our friend circle. And I think when you come into an environment where let's all welcome each other into this life that we're building, you know, collaboratively, then there won't be as much judgment. And I think what friends tend to do is if you just throw in your partner into the mix, Friends think you're testing them. You know, friends think, oh, okay, great. Now it's my time to judge. I'm going to be a little critical. I didn't like the way she said that. I didn't like the way she drank her tequila, whatever. <laughs> but if you bring it, if you set the environment right and tell your friends to to tell them how much this means, how much this partner means to you, I think the friends will be less critical and see this more of a, can we all hang out together and kind of move forward together? I'm 100% tracking with you. I love that. I love also in if Jen approaches her friends like that, what she's saying is it really isn't even it, it really isn't even about Alexa. It's about it's about me. Like I'm asking for this for me. Like the way that you all can take care of me is by showing up in this way. So it really is like there's there's a really there's an ask in that. You know, there's an appeal in it versus saying like you guys, I don't know if you'll like her. You might not like her, but if you don't like her, then it's okay. Or, you know, whatever. Like, it's not really even about Alexa. It's about Jen's relationship with these people. And so she's saying, what would mean a lot to me, as you're saying, UA, is your warmth, your openness, like your welcoming. Beautiful. Julie, what would you add? I wish I got that advice as a friend years ago, because I recall a situation that I'm not proud of today where the exact thing happened is a friend of ours introduced her partner 
And we didn't know how serious it was. We all went into critique mode. Mm, And uh to the point where we actually had an intervention with her and said, like, we don't think this is the right partner for you, which I will never do again unless there is a clear reason for that that's like abuse. Uh, That being said, she held her ground and she was like, this is the right person for me. They are married today with two children. We love her partner (laughs) now. And, you know, I think it's one of those things that like while your friend's opinions, of course, are important and you shouldn't ignore them completely, like if they're valid, but you also need to stick with your gun. Like if Jen really feels so strongly about Alexa She needs to move that forward regardless of what her friends think. But I think setting forward that expectation of, like, this person's important to me, I want them to be part of our lives, like, as the friends, too, is really important. I also think it depends. There's so many factors, too. When this situation that I referenced happened, we were, like, in our, you know, late 20s. Some of I was very single at the time. I'm sure there was an element of just being afraid that my friend was leaving me as well, you know, that was mixed Mm. in. So I think you need to remember that too when you're introducing to friends. So there's a lot going on in this mix that's not always so straightforward. That's right. Friends don't have the capital T truth perspective on this person or your relationship. Their experiences are filtered through the lens of exactly what you're Mm -hmm. saying, Julie. Their current relationship status, their fear of losing you, their their kind of internal architecture of what they think a healthy relationship mm-hmm. looks like or an ideal relationship looks like, which may not be any better or more accurate than yours. That's right. It's really important for, we would want Jen to keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. And I think like as a friend too, what I've learned from this experience is it doesn't matter I think what I put so much weight on is like, would I date this person? Would I like them as a person? Oh, right. 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 And ultimately, that doesn't matter. No, you're not dating them. If they're treating your friend well, that's all that matters. Like, I think there's a very difference of friends raising legitimate concerns versus, oh, this just isn't the type of person I'd be attracted to. Who cares? You know? Oh, such a good point. And thank goodness, because then everybody would want to date the same person. And that would just be really confusing. So thank goodness there are different people for different people. Right. Thank Thank goodness. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I understand, I really understand how friends come by this idea that my job is to size this yes. person up. They come by that yes. real honestly. I mean, it's, it's why I think reality shows are so popular because they capitalize on something kind of intrinsic in all of us, which is like, ooh, yes. do I get a vote? What do I get to, you know, yes. how do I get to pick this apart? Yes. So that is, there's something really inherent in us that gets so captivated by will they, won't they, and what's the chemistry and what's the dynamics? So it is, while that feels really natural, while reality shows really normalize that idea mm-hmm. that what we're what we're supposed to do or what we get to do or what we're entitled to do is judge the shit out of everybody's relationships <laughs> yep. it is that much more important for us to subvert that and be like no that's actually not what is needed here I love also you know UA when you were speaking to like kind of how Jen can set the friends up for success I love this idea of like If the friends are paying attention to anything, have the friends pay attention to how do I seem with this person? Like what, you know, in what ways do I seem lit up, fully present, you know, because that's really what matters. What matters is how does Jen seem in this relationship rather than putting Alexa under a microscope? A hundred percent. Right. It's not about Alexa. It's about Jen. (laughs) I'm really impressed that in this question, none of our Alexas have gone off to uh, (laughs) ask us what we need. (laughs) Mine are luckily in a different room or they'd be going crazy. Yeah, mine's in a different room. (laughs) (laughs) My laptop usually does that. So, okay. Good. Let's hold that thought for a quick message. Okay, this is an interesting one. This one's about public displays of affection, a.k.a. PDA. We love this topic. (laughs) You do? One partner is really into PDA. Their love language is physical touch, and they are a confident person who loves to show their love in this way. The other partner loves this about them in private, but in public, not so much. Is there a middle ground for these two? Should the anti-PDA partner, quote unquote, win? Mm. (laughs) There's no winning or losing in this. There's no (laughs) winning or losing in relationships. Come on. Nobody's trying to win. Nobody's trying to lose. 
The key here is to seek understanding. As someone who is not into PDA, and I've been with partners who were, I asked a lot of questions. What is it about displaying affection in public that brings you so much joy. And sometimes when I hear, I mean, I had one partner who said, I'm so proud to be with you and I want to show the world how lucky I am to be with you. That to me made me want to show more affection to him in public because it came from such a lovely place. I've also had partners say, oh, I don't know, who cares? Like, F the world. Who cares what they think? You know, I can do whatever I want. That comes from a place of ego. And that does not make me want to meet that partner, you know, even halfway. So I think just seeking that understanding. And as as a partner who does like public displays of affection, it's also it's also important to seek understanding of why your your partner is more private. And, you know, for me personally, I feel like I can deepen intimacy when we're in private and I feel safer and I can I can be more of myself and I can show more of my love. And so why wouldn't a partner want more of my love when I'm put in the right environment? So seeking understanding is is the key here. Beautiful. I also think there's a huge there is a huge spectrum of PDA too. So I absolutely think there is compromise here. Yeah. Like there's a big difference like, of Lauren Bobert <laughs> too. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> exactly. <laughs> like there's a huge difference of holding hands or linking arms versus like publicly slobbering each other's face. Like there's a very big difference there. <laughs> and also context. Like are you with family members? That's very different than if you're just like at a bar, just the two of you. So I think it's not necessarily a cut and dry, this is we're never going to do PDA or we are going to do PDA. I think it's talking about the different scenarios and Maybe you can like ease someone in in a scenario where you're not like in front or maybe even just learn that someone, the real reason they don't like PDA is they don't want to make other people uncomfortable. But if you're with a bunch of people you don't know, that's very different than if you're sitting there with your mom and dad, right? (laughs) So yeah, having those conversations are important. I like the idea of starting the conversation like way, way back around like what did you see in your family growing up? Like how did the grown ups Mm. in your family, like what was not only like how did you perhaps see your parents model touch and affection, both inside of the home, because there's a way when you're a little kid, your parents, you know, hugging or kissing or not hugging, kissing, like that is PDA, right? Because it is public to you as a kid. So you saw stuff growing up that was part of your kind of early socialization around how much do couples touch and in what context and how casual versus formal is it? So I love a conversation that starts way, way back. And also, how did your family talk about couples you would see out and about touching Mm. or not touching, right? What were the, because there's lots of ways that we take in messages. And this is also deeply cultural, right? Like there's been research around um, like in different parts of the world, you know, like literally how close to each other you stand when you're talking versus how apart from each other you stand. So everything around physical space and how you move through public space is highly, highly socialized. I think oftentimes cross-cultural, like couples where there is a an actual cross-cultural difference, like a capital C cross-cultural difference, if they aren't talking about it, what it feels like you are rejecting me when in fact we're just bumping up against something that is a deeply ingrained cultural difference. Yeah. And then also like the lowercase c, like the family cultural difference too. Like how did our families do this? So that a conversation that starts all the way back around culture really does take the sting out of it or the defensiveness out of it, or certainly like not the, as as you, as you were saying, like not the win, lose, right, wrong, or in you know, Julia, as you were saying, like either all PDA is good or all PDA is bad. That's like the least interesting way to approach this conversation. So yeah, I like that idea of like, what are the stories and musings and messages that you got as you were growing up? And perhaps in past relationships, because you, your yeah. point about a partner who said, I love to hold your hand in public because I'm so proud of you and how that allowed you to slide a bit more towards their way of doing it. I can imagine another situation where, Right. If it felt like you need to hold my hand because I'm like a trophy, that doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Or you need Mm -hmm. to hold my hand because you're so deeply insecure. It Mm -hmm. sort of is like what what are what's the energy beneath and behind the desire to hold or not hold? You know. I mean, I think this is what makes 
all these situations so rich is like yeah. if you look at it, there actually is a big opportunity here to better understand your partner. Yes. We hear like daters all the time. And honestly, we believe this even in really early stage dating. People just make so many assumptions, quick to call everything a red flag or leave any situation that they have where it's not like 100% aligned at all times. But having these conversations, this is what deepens connection. And that's what's missing in today's dating world. Yeah. In that space of friction. Uh Uh-oh, I feel a little friction here. I don't know what this person means or where they're coming from. The knee jerk is to just cut and run. I think I maybe told you guys this when I was on your show, but the theme last year with my Marriage 101 college students, so so it's a unique sample and a smaller sample, but the theme across office hours last year was students coming in and saying, I'm really aware that I have a very low threshold for frustration for friction in a relationship, whether it's a friendship or an intimate partnership, like the first sign of, I don't get where you're you're coming from, or this is unclear to me. I just tag out. And um, and I love the self-awareness of knowing that one has that because then that opens the door to, okay, so what's, what are the relational skills that I have to fill in? Like, what are the capacities I have to develop around asking rather than assuming, which is what you're saying, Julie, is that there's so much uncertainty and complexity. And it's hard to ask and it can feel safer to assume, but that's when we get into relationship chicken. Yeah, exactly. I got so excited when you brought up culture because I can imagine having that discussion with a partner and how much more you will learn about that person. And it no longer becomes about why don't you hold my hand in public? It becomes, <laughs> tell me more about what you grew up seeing. I mean, that gets me so excited. I think those are the conversations that need to be had in dating that we don't have. We are always looking at everything at face value. It's about the PDA. It's about this conflict at hand. But if we peel back and just say, I, this is a stranger. Like ultimately we're dating strangers and I'm just trying to understand them deeply. And how do I do that in this opportunity? I hope that everybody listening right now can get excited about that and that we can be more motivated to get to know the people we're dating, even if they don't last. Who cares? Like how how interesting would that be to learn how someone saw PDA growing up? That's fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. We just assume everyone's the exact same as us. And if they're yeah. not, then we leave. <laughs> That's what happens. Well, and, and or if there's a difference, yeah. that the difference is scary. I am going to, uh, I'm going to offend you. I'm going to alienate you. I'm going to like be otherized by you if we start talking explicitly about culture, right? Cultural difference scares us or we don't know how many of us, some of us don't know how to approach it. And we're afraid of either putting our foot in our mouth or being, I think for people, for those who are members of marginalized cultures, be feeling like sort of fetishized or otherized or, you know, mm-hmm. like, all, like so that's, it's, it's really tender. But UA, your point is so good that like, Right. Like this is an opportunity. And I'm really struck when I have cross-cultural couples in therapy very often, they haven't, they haven't really talked about the role, the ways in which culture profoundly and subtly shapes their dynamics that, right. To your point, Julie, like PDA is not just about PDA. It's also about all of these layers. Yeah. And it's a hundred percent culture, a hundred percent, but I think it goes to every difference, like the way we process information in general and upbringing, like It's like you're never going to meet the carbon copy of yourself. Like even if on paper they seem like it. I hope you don't. Yeah, exactly. That's not interesting. (laughs) (laughs) I I love the way that we can kind of like point our lens at something like PDA and then kind of add that complexity to it. It's like my favorite thing to do. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) let's do one more. (laughs) Okay. This is about contact with an X. This is a biggie. Mm. Ooh, Oof, I like the topic. This <laughs> yeah, this is a big one. Okay. So after a difficult but mostly amicable breakup, Joe, who initiated the breakup, wants to stay in contact with his ex. They left on relatively good terms. And although Joe was the one to raise the conversation, his partner felt similarly that the relationship didn't have lasting potential. However, Joe does not like the idea of cutting his ex out of his life forever, so he plans to check in once in a while just to say hi. Is this okay? 
what should Joe take into consideration when deciding how to interact with his ex going forward? So as Joe builds a new relationship, what do we want Joe to keep in mind? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> we have different opinions on this one, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we discuss this topic all the time. I'll give you my opinion and I'll give you an opinion of what Joe should consider. My opinion is I murder my exes mentally I, all the time. There's a graveyard in my head and they're dead. I cut them off, block them, never talk to them again. But for Joe and for, I guess, everybody else, something to consider is right after a relationship, there is a period of familiarity that fakes this idea or this feeling of closeness to someone because you're familiar with them. So there is always temptation to go back to the familiar. So when something happens to you, this happens all the time in relationships, you break up and then something happens that reminds you of your partner and you want to reach out to them. Because I can't believe the neighbor did this thing. Remember when we talked about this? Because you want to go fall back to the familiarity. And once you establish that connection and the communication again, it makes you feel like you're close to this person again. It's a very risky period because your feelings are still confused uh, by what this breakup means. So I would highly recommend for Joe to take some time and say, I don't want to cut you out of my life forever, but I think we should take some time to heal. So let's say yes. three months, six months to really be away and apart from each other. And then let's pick a date in three months. And that day we'll check in on each other and say hi. So then you know that this period of uh, apart is kind of temporary and you can time box it. But that period is so important to really leave the relationship, to grieve the relationship, to to clear out the energy of that relationship before you establish contact again. Wonderful. I love the time boxing. I also love the idea of when there's that urge, like the neighbor, the neighbor's dog does the thing, to just even set a timer, like a 10-minute timer on your phone to just say, I'm going to hold the urge to text my ex. Oh, I'm going to hold yeah. it for 10 minutes. And if you can hold it for 10 minutes, it probably will pass, right? Urgency can't stay urgent for that long. So just, and then celebrate the ever-loving shit out of yourself for having done it, like having ridden the wave of the urge, right? Because the wave will crest and recede if you can ride it out. It's not going to stay at a 10 out of 10 urgency. So the big time boxing around, I'm not going to contact my ex for this length of time, in the sort of micro time boxing of I have an urge to reach out because of the familiarity. I love bringing that word familiarity. How would we not want what's familiar? And then knowing that that urge will pass. I really love that because, like, in 10 minutes, that dog scenario might not be interesting in the slightest. And right. you might realize that no one cares about that. So, <laughs> I, okay, so I have an opinion on it that I don't mentally murder my ex. So I differ from <laughs> UA that way. I do agree on the time boxing 100%. Like, you hear it called no contact. Right. And a lot of times, no contact is referred to as like a manipulation technique to get your ex back. Like, I'm going to go no contact and have them come back. But I don't think that's the right approach. But I do think giving yourself that time away is really important. So 100% on the same page on that. The part about mentally murdering, and this is the part that's hard, <laughs> is that like, I do understand why people want to stay in touch with people because you know, you had such an important time together. And especially if nothing went down that was bad, why cut this person out of your life? I understand that logistically. And for a while, I used to believe it. And I think in some scenarios, it can work. Like if both parties really have moved on, like in this one, it sounds like at least surface level, they both agree that this wasn't the right match. And if that's true, sure, in three months, maybe they can be friends or check in once in a while. But if there's any underlying feelings from either one of them, then this is just going to get in the way of them actually finding the right relationship for you, for them. So I think it's really important to be honest with yourself. And I did this for years and I don't think I was honest with myself of like the real reason why I wanted to get in touch with my ex was because I wanted it to have a second chance, not because I genuinely just wanted to see how they were doing. So I'm just a, curious. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, we hide under that context. So 
understanding is really important. And even if this person, let's say hypothetically, you're both over it and you're checking in every once in a while, I think when you actually get into a new relationship, you also have to think about how it impacts that person. Like, is this relationship serving you? And there may be scenarios out there that it's not a threat whatsoever. It's purely platonic. It's not a big deal. But then other ones, and also like, how often are you checking it? Are you guys texting every day, all day? Or is it like once every five months? You know, there's a big difference there too. So ultimately, you need to think about like, what value is this relationship having? And instead of holding on to every last relationship, recognizing there might be it doesn't diminish what you had and the feelings you had for this person. Like there are exes for me personally, I've had to let go because they were getting in the way of my current relationship and whatnot. So for me, it was like, while of course I'd love to see how they're doing and check in, I ultimately know that's actually not what's best for me and probably them either. So it's something I have to let go. That piece about empathy is so huge, isn't it, Julie? Like, mm. th- like even though, even if you may be totally fine with it, if yeah. your ex is trying to establish a new relationship and you are getting in the way of your ex establishing a new relationship, you have an ethical and empathic responsibility to back up and let go. And I think that part you're saying, too, about letting somebody go and really not having contact with them isn't doesn't diminish the significance of the relationship. I think mm-hmm. sometimes we get that confused, don't we? That if I right. don't if I don't at least check in with them sometimes, then what did that relationship possibly mean? Oh, it could have meant it could have meant absolutely a ton and it could have been something really important in your the the, the contact no contact doesn't determine the value and the importance and significance of the relationship. Right. Yeah, there needs to be another term that's not as extreme as mentally murdering. And then also not like <laughs> UA, I'm BFF with my UA. friends. She gonna go to jail for that one, right? So she is in mental prison for all I mean, her mental murders. Maybe some people deserve it, but <laughs> 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 oh, something more humane. <laughs> Where something I just lock them up. More... I lock them up. Okay, mentally lock them up in a dark room, I'm and not then sure eventually I'll I let bet, them out. But... <laughs> <laughs> what about perhaps they're on an island? <laughs> I, I love. They're that. on vacation. You guys are they're away on from vacation. each other. <laughs> on vacation from your life. There's no Wi-Fi available. Yeah, exactly. There's no Wi-Fi. They're living their no best lives. lives. And there's no transportation. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. they're stranded. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we solved it. There's a way to think oh, about this positively. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to wrap this up. I could talk to you all for a long time. You are funny and you are smart and you're practical. And I'm so appreciative of the work that you're putting out in the world on the Dateable podcast. So let people know how to connect more deeply with you and follow along with all of what you're doing. We love you, too, so much. Just by the way, for the record, we love you uh, so much. Uh, People can find us on our website, datablepodcast.com. They can find us on any platform where they listen to their favorite podcasts. And also they can connect with us on Instagram at datablepodcast is our handle. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. Thank you, Julie and Yue, for joining me here on Reimagining Love. To hear more from them, you can find a link to both the Dateable and the Exit Interviews podcast in the show notes, including the recent episode of the Dateable podcast, where I joined them to discuss how to navigate a pace discrepancy. See you next week for another episode of Reimagining Love. Until then, be well. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love. 
The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Media Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Dateable Podcast and visit datablepodcast.com for access to all the episodes in our premium programs. Also, make sure to subscribe today if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform so you are the first to get all the latest episodes. And most importantly, stay dateable. Thank you.